Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight is the last Sunday night of the month. You know, it's amazing to me how quickly these come. It seems like just a week or two ago that I was doing the Q&A for uh, May, and it's already the end of June. So um, again, I encourage you to submit questions. Um, again, I could probably name three or four of you who said, I've got a good question, but I never got it. So uh, the questions are good, but they're no good if I can't answer them because you forget to send them to me. Uh, I will encourage you, the ones that I've gotten for this month, I've gotten electronically, one by email, and then my daughter just zips me a text every time she thinks of a question, and so seven of the questions tonight are hers, <laughs> um, and that's fine, and we appreciate that. So uh, let's begin this evening, and, and uh, the first question it says, when we die, Christians will go to paradise. What will we do while in paradise? The only account of paradise is the rich man and Lazarus, and there's nothing mentioned about it. Maybe we just simply don't know. So turn to Luke 16, and that's where we have the, the parable, not the parable, excuse me, the account of the rich man and Lazarus. I'm careful not to call that a parable because I don't believe it is. I believe the story of the rich man and Lazarus is an actual account of two people who lived. It's never called a parable. Uh, Jesus tells it as if these men really existed. And I don't want to read the whole account, but uh, because we know the story, but we're going to start at verse 22 and read to 25. This is the part that deals most uh, pointedly at our question. It says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And then the other time that paradise is mentioned is, of course, when Jesus was on the cross and he tells the thief next to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. So really, when you get down to it, the one who asked the question gave the answer. He says, maybe we simply just don't know. And I think that's, that's probably right. The only thing that we can certainly say about paradise from those passages is it's a place of comfort because Abraham says that now Lazarus was being comforted. We can also say that it's not a state of unconsciousness. You know, there are some religious groups who talk or, or teach the doctrine of soul sleep. The idea that, you know, between the time you die and the return of Jesus, you, you sort of go to sleep and you're unaware uh, of your surroundings. And I, and I think this, this account here tells us that that's not true. We have, um, well, we don't hear from Lazarus, but we certainly hear from the rich man. And he was aware of his surroundings. He was conscious and uh, he even remembered Lazarus. He remembered his, his life. So uh, as to exactly what we're going to be doing while we're in paradise, the Bible just doesn't say. Um, you know, in our experience, we like, to, we like to follow a schedule. Some of us, some are better at following schedules than others. But we like to have a, you know, a schedule planned out and know what we're going to be doing at what time and that sort of thing. But when it comes to paradise... In heaven, so life after death in general, you know, we just don't know. Uh, we're depicted in heaven as uh, the, those who are in heaven are going to be praising God, but 
what will occupy uh, our thoughts and our time, if you can think of time and eternity together, it kind of boggles the mind. I, I'm going to quote Deuteronomy 29, 29, which says, The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong to God. If, if, if we needed to know more details, he would give us more details. I think it's enough to know that paradise is a place of comfort and that torment is a place of torment. And we want to go to paradise and not torment. Now, the second part of this question, it, it was all related, but I broke it up into two. It says, will we see Jesus or God while in paradise? Again, he says, the Bible doesn't say, so we don't know it either? Question mark. Heaven and, heaven and paradise are two different places. We need to understand that. When the soul, when a person dies, they go to what is often referred to as Hades. And Hades is either paradise or torment, the two places we've been talking about. And then when the Lord comes back and on the judgment day, we all go to him in judgment. And then we go to our eternal abode, which will either be heaven or hell. Now we know that Jesus and God the Father are in heaven. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, notice what the Hebrew writer says. He says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so that and other passages, I think, point out that both the Father and the Son are located in heaven. That's certainly where the Father is and Jesus is at his right hand. Now we know that Jesus visited paradise when he died and before he ascended to the, was resurrected and then ascended to the Father. Uh, he spent that period of time while he was in the tomb. He spent that time uh, in paradise. But he's not there now. He is in heaven. I think... So the answer to the question, will we see Jesus or God while in paradise? My answer would be probably not, unless there's something that we're not told. Okay? Um, and that, that's possible. So sometimes when we say that a loved one has gone and he's with Jesus now, well, he's in the care of God. If he's gone to paradise, then you know he's within God's care and God is seeing that that individual is comforted. But I think technically speaking, um, I think we're not going to be with Jesus until after the judgment when we go to be with him in heaven. So that, that's the best answer I can give to that. And then the third part of this question is, what is the point of judgment since we already know where we are going? And again, the person answers their question. He says, is this a formality of things just to go from paradise to heaven? This also is to mark the end of the world as well, so it puts an end to the world and mankind as we know it. Well, it's true that as soon as we die, our fate has already been sealed. Because we, you know, we can reason, if I've gone to torment, I know where I'm going to go after the judgment. I'm going to be lost. I'm going to go to hell. And if I go to paradise, I know that I'm going to stand before Jesus and I'm going to hear, well done, enter in, and I'm going to get to go to heaven. So we'll know the moment after death where we're going to spend eternity. The judgment is, as, as the question stated, it's sort of a transition from Hades to the eternal abode, to either heaven or to hell. And so what's the point of the judgment? Why is it needed if God has already judged us and, and um, determined where we're going to spend eternity? And I liken it to a prisoner who's been found guilty of a crime. 
And we know that, you know, when someone is found guilty of a crime, eventually he goes back before the judge and is sentenced um, according to their crime and, you know, punished accordingly. And so in a lot of ways, I think the judgment is like that. It's every individual's opportunity to stand before God and hear God himself pronounce his judgment and presumably why. Um, that individual is either going to be saved or going to be lost. But it is true that, um, you know, we know where we're going to go as soon as we die. Okay, next question is, what does the word Pentecost mean? The word Pentecost. The word Pentecost is actually another name for what is often referred to as the Feast of Weeks. In the Old Testament. If you would look at Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12, this is one of the places where God sets forth um, regulations for the keeping of this Feast of Weeks. Deuteronomy 16, 9 to 12 it says, You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then ye shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God uh, with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widows who are among you at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. So from the time that they began to harvest, they put the sickle to the grain, they were to count seven weeks. And then on the next day started this feast. And so seven weeks, seven times seven, seven days in a week, that's 49 days. So the feast actually started on the 50th day after the harvest began. The word Pentecost is the Greek word for 50th. And so that's where the name Pentecost comes from. By the time of the the New Testament, uh, this was called the Feast of Pentecost because it took place on the 50th day uh, after the beginning of the harvest. Okay, now a lot of these questions are, are... Fairly simple, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. Some of them we can make a sermon out of as well, so, but we'll keep them brief. Uh, This question, again, merits really a whole sermon, or I've even spent a whole quarter in a class on this, uh, on angels. But the question is, uh, could angels be seen or leave marks to be seen, and what are the limits of angels? Now, I know, you know, the, the topic or the idea of angels is very popular uh, in the world. Um, there have been TV shows that deal with, you know, angels and whatnot. And um, one of the ones that, dating myself now, but it was older, you know, Highway to Heaven, uh, dealt with an angel. And, you know, there are a lot of folks uh, who believe that, you know, perhaps they have today encountered an angel or seen um, something happen that they attribute to the work of an angel. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about what the angels are doing and how they do it. Hebrews 1 and verse 14, the Hebrews writer refers to angels as ministering spirits that are sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So they're ministering spirits spirits or their servants and they're ministering for, for us, for Christians. They're helping us. But again, we're not told how that works, how, that, how they go about doing that. Could angels be seen? Well, scripturally speaking, we know that if they wanted to be seen, they could be seen. Uh, remember the account in 2 Kings 6 of Elisha, when the king of Syria had become angry because Elisha was giving away all of his secrets and warning the nation of Israel when the king of Assyria was going to attack and and they would always be ready. And the king of Assyria thought he had a spy among them. 
and someone told him, no, there's no spy. It's that Elisha guy. He's, he's telling God everything we're going to do before we do it. And so the king of Syria comes and surrounds the place where Elisha lives. And you remember that Elisha's servant was very concerned when he saw that. Second Kings 6 and verse 17, it says, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, talking about his servant, that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes, the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That was a heavenly host that he was seeing. As we read the various accounts in the Old Testament where angels appeared, for example, to Abraham, um, we know that um, they have the ability to manifest themselves and appear even as normal human beings. Um, and then we have a Hebrews 13 and verse 2 that tells us, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I personally think that's a reference back to Abraham. What are angels capable of doing today? Do angels appear today? What do they do um, I'm not going to answer that because we just don't know. Um, Do I believe it's possible that angels could appear and interact with people? I'm going to say yes, it's possible. But we just simply don't know. And always very careful, you know, something amazing happens and somebody wants to attribute it to an angel. Um, Very careful to say something like that. I think we ought to... um, stick with what the Bible reveals uh, and not, you know, wander off into talking about, you know, well, what do angels do and how do they do it? If Again, if God wanted us to have more information on that topic, he would have given it to us. Next question is, does the Bible confirm that witchcraft is real? Or when we're referring to magic, is it talking about trickery? Well, um, the practice of witchcraft was real. I mean, it had existed in the past and it still exists today. But the Bible, I don't think it implies anywhere that there's any real actual validity to it or power behind it. I don't think that's ever brought forth in the scriptures. The only example we ever have in the scriptures where someone who was uh, practicing witchcraft or uh, this person's called a medium who was supposed to be able to call forth spirits, was uh, during the time when Saul was the king of Israel. You know the story. He wanted some advice from Samuel, but Samuel had already died. And so he goes to this witch or this medium and says, I want you to bring back uh, Samuel uh, so that I can talk to him. And she's worried initially because, you know, that her practice had been outlawed and she was worried about getting in trouble. And Saul says, "Um, I'm not going to punish you for this. And so in 1 Samuel 28, um, beginning of verse 11, she says to Saul, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. And then it says in verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me for you are Saul? So I laugh every time I read this passage. Um, She's called Samuel forth. Presumably she's called forth hundreds of spirits throughout her career, but notice the in my opinion, the one time it actually worked, scared her to death. It says she cried out with a loud voice. Um, That implies to me that it was what she practiced was not actually calling forth spirits from the dead, but trickery. And you know as well as I do that those who claim to be able to do such things, they're very skilled at deceit and uh, saying things that are very vague uh, and applicable to just about anybody to, to make it seem like they're talking to a dead person or whatever it might be. So, um, again, I don't think the Bible sets forth witchcraft or sorcery as something that actually has any power behind it. It's a sinful practice because the individuals who are doing such things are claiming to do such things. They're being deceitful and also... Um, 
they're claiming a power that does not exist that they don't have. And many times these powers that they claim to have actually go against scripture and what God has set forth uh, in his plan. Okay, next question. Um, Since God is all powerful, why doesn't he just get rid of the devil? And these are, these are good common sense type questions um, that a young person would ask. And we ought to know how to answer these. If he's all powerful, then why doesn't he just get rid of the devil? And I can imagine someone who is an atheist, who doesn't believe in God, using this as an argument against the existence of God. And saying, you know, if there really is an all powerful God, then why doesn't he just get rid of the devil and everything will be just fine and, and dandy? Well, the answer is God has gotten rid of the devil. The devil just don't know it yet. The devil has been defeated. When Jesus died on the cross, the devil got kicked in the head. Remember Genesis 3 and verse 15, when God is speaking to the serpent and pronouncing punishment on the devil, he says, I'll put enmity between your seed, uh, excuse me, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, He shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. When Jesus died on the cross, the devil got kicked in the head, so to speak. He got got wounded, a death blow. And as such, the devil's been defeated. When Jesus died on the cross, the devil, I believe, thought that he was winning a victory because he did not understand God's plan. But yet when Jesus died, that actually put the final nail in the coffin of the devil. Um... In Hebrews 2 and verse 14, it says, Inasmuch as the children uh, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, talking about Jesus, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So the devil has been defeated. Okay. Now, you know, God permits the devil to continue to roam the earth. He commit, He permits the devil to uh, continue to influence uh, individuals. But when the time comes, the devil's going to be confined to hell with his angels and with all of those who have not done the will of God. The Bible talks about a place that God has prepared. Um, Jesus in Matthew 25, 41 talks about the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, it talks about uh, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Well, I believe the devil is one of those angels that fell. He's the leader of those angels who fell. And so, again, he has been defeated, uh, but... God, in His wisdom, allows the devil to continue to influence people. And personally, I think that's because this world is a, is a test for us. You know, who are we going to choose? If God's the only choice, that's not much of a choice. That's not very much freedom of will. But we have a choice between God, who is good, God, who is light, and the devil, who is darkness and evil. Um, to choose. I believe that's why God allows the devil to continue uh, to influence the world. The next question, um, what happened to the Garden of Eden? Did it get destroyed in the flood? So we know that the scriptures talk about the Garden of Eden where God placed Adam and Eve and you know the The critic or the liberal-minded individual might say that that was just a fictional place. It's a a metaphor for paradise or whatever. But I believe the Garden of Eden was a literal place on the earth. But I don't believe it still is out there today for somebody to find. I do believe it was probably destroyed in the flood uh, of Noah's time. The world in which we live today uh, is very different from the world that God originally created. We know that. Uh, You know, scientifically, we know that this world used to be different. There used to be jungles um, at the North Pole. Um, Evidence have been found of that type of thing. And so 
Uh, we believe as Christians that those drastic changes came about as a result of the flood, which changed this world. And if you think about the damage that a flood, just a local flood can do, how it can take an area that you may have lived in all your life and make it look you know, like something completely different, imagine what a global flood could do in that amount of water. Imagine, again, this world looks completely different than what it originally did. Okay. Last question we're going to uh, deal with uh, tonight, I think, is what does 1 Timothy 2.15 mean? 1 Timothy 2.15. So we're going to read the context. 1 Timothy 2. We're going to start in verse 12. Here Paul writes, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So verse 15, well, first of all, the whole passage is dealing with the fact Paul sets forth the fact that men and women have different roles and that um, it wasn't, it's, it's unlawful in a spiritual sense for a woman to have authority over a man. Now that's only in a spiritual context. There's nothing wrong with a woman being the boss of a man in the secular world, having authority over a man. But when we're talking about in a spiritual sense, in a worship sense, um, it's wrong for a woman to have authority over a man. And then he gives the reason It's not just because that was the culture of the day. He says it goes back to the fact that when God created us, he made man first, and also the fact that Eve was the one who was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. I don't know what that says about Adam. He did what he did knowing that what it was wrong, but Eve was the one who was deceived. And so part of her punishment, which has been carried down to to all women, is that they're to be in subjection in a spiritual sense to their husbands um, in general. Now, verse 15, he says, Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now, some feel that this passage is making reference to the fact that it was through a woman that Jesus came. Okay? She'll be saved through childbearing. And so some see this as messianic in the sense of it's it's pointing out that, you know, even even though Eve made this mistake and there are consequences that still affect women today, that it was going to be a woman who would bring the Messiah into the world. Okay. I don't I don't think there's anything wrong about that view. If you want to take that understanding of this passage, I don't think. I don't think we can know exactly what this means. This is one of those difficult passages. Personally, that's not what I think it means. Paul sets forth here again that that Eve had sinned, and as a result, women were to be subject to men, a, a wife to her husband. And it seems like he wants to point out here that regardless of that fact, women can still be saved, okay? Uh, Women are not second-class citizens, so to speak. They still have a place and a purpose in the kingdom of God. And so, um, to me, it seems to be saying that even though, you know, a woman must be subordinate to her husband, she can still be saved. She can still be a faithful servant of God by fulfilling the role that that God has given her. Okay? And and one of those roles is childbearing. Um, If you look at Titus 2, verses 3 through 5, here Paul writes, The aged women also uh, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I should have noted that word child buried back in 1 Timothy 2.15, it's not only talking about the physical act of giving birth. 
it's talking about the raising of children as well. Okay, and so one of one of the roles that God has set forth for woman is you know raising children. Now, of course, it's the father's job as well to help in that. So, I think what we have here is Paul saying yes. A woman is to be in subjection to the man, but she's not a second-class citizen, so to speak. She still has a place in God's kingdom, and she still can be saved if she lives as God would have her to live. I know there's always, you know, a question, what about a woman who chooses to not have children or a woman who maybe is unable to have children? Is she somehow negated by this from being saved? And the answer is, of course not. Um, This does not mean that a woman has to have children in order to be able to be considered faithful to God. That's not saying that. I think this is an overall uh, reference to, a a general reference to the role of of women, uh, which is to be in submission to their husband and, and be keepers of the home, which is what God set forth as his plan. You know, a lot of, I'd say basically all the other world religions, none of them set forth women as the Bible does or honors women as the Bible does. You look at the religion of Islam um, and you know their views on women and concerning women. Um, it's ridiculous, really, when you get right down to it. The Bible does honor women. Now, it sets forth that there are definite roles between the male and the female, And we have to live up to those roles and and accept them. Um, But the Bible exalts the the female and the wife. All right, there is one other question. It's very simple, so I'll just go ahead and answer that uh, real quick. It says, in a book I'm reading, they're talking about the true cross. Was the actual cross Jesus was crucified on saved and eventually taken by enemies? Or was the cross lost right after Jesus was crucified? So, you know, I imagine if you go over to Jerusalem or somewhere, you could probably buy a part of Jesus' cross. Um, there are probably many, probably the equivalent of thousands of crosses have been sold throughout the ages. Um, there was nothing special about the wood upon which Jesus hung, okay? Um, that wood has not been preserved um, we don't know what happened to that wood that on which he hung. What was important was who was on the cross uh, and what was accomplished there on the cross. You know, we see it's a repeated pattern that these artifacts um, disappear, don't they? We have the cross. We don't have it anymore. Uh, the, the shroud of Turin, you know, the cloth that Jesus was wrapped in, Um, We don't have that anymore, even though they claim that they do. Um, You think about the Ark of the Covenant, Noah's Ark, uh, all these different things that if they still existed today, man would be inclined to worship them. God has seen that they've passed away. And I think, you know, if the cross of Jesus was still around, definitely people would feel the need to worship that piece of wood. It's not the wood, though, that needs to be glorified. It's the one who died uh, on that cross. So I do not believe that the cross has been preserved uh, in any way. I think just like the Ark of the Covenant and other artifacts, it has passed away through history and probably been destroyed by now. So again, I appreciate the questions. Hopefully they were helpful and um, interesting. And again, encourage you to submit your questions for next month. And uh, we'll deal with them at that time. Right now, we're going to conclude by offering an invitation. If there are any here tonight who have not yet obeyed the gospel, now is the opportunity to do that. We had a baptism this morning, and that was wonderful. If there are any here who have not yet obeyed the gospel and would like to be baptized into Christ today, we would encourage you to make that decision. If you believe in Jesus, are willing to repent and confess your faith, then you can be baptized to begin your walk with Christ. If you've already done that, but you've ceased to live faithfully, we're here to help you. We can pray for you and uh, encourage you as you strive to live the way that God would, would want you to live. If there's any way we can help, please come as we stand and sing.
Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.